Hello, everyone. I'm Russ of Aquarimax, and I'm here with Richard from the Tarantula Collective. We're really excited to have him as a guest. We've been setting this up. So welcome, Richard. Hello. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah. Yeah, this is pretty pretty exciting. We've got a lot of people who have mentioned they're uh, excited to see this. And uh, it was it was Peter of Bugs in Cyberspace who kind of helped us start making this connection. And I went and uh, subscribed yeah. to you when he suggested that and checked out your videos. You got some awesome stuff going on. So I thought this would Thank be great. You. Appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. So Peter's a good guy. I enjoy him he a lot. He is. He's, he's awesome. So we got lots of people popping into the stream, looks like now. And basically, just so everybody knows, um, because this is the Tarantula Collective, most of the questions we want you <clears> to focus on Tarantula-based questions. But I did want, Richard, do you just introduce yourself? I know a little bit about from watching your videos how you got into the hobby, but I'd love to hear that. And I'm sure many of our viewers would. How did you get into keeping tarantulas? <laughs> it's, a, it's a long, sordid story. <laughs> um, it started, I guess... Oh, uh, uh, my freshman year of college, I was uh, out to South Dakota. I was going to a school out there, and it was like a, a private liberal arts school. Pretty much everybody was they 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 were all from like Sioux Falls. You know, they all uh, sorry, I just started playing on the other website. They <laughs> they knew each. I was like the weird guy. You know what I mean? I came from West Virginia to South Dakota. Pretty much everybody else grew up in Sioux Falls, so I was already kind of. Uh, an outcast. So I, I was starting to kind of connect with some, uh, pretty much my sociology and uh, psychology professors. And I was kind of like a punk rock kid, you know, tight jeans and misfit shirts and, and looked really, you know, hard. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but uh, tried to look as intimidating as possible. But if I would come out of the dorms into a spider web, I, I would freak out and start, you know, <laughs> losing my stuff. I would like panic. I'm not panic, but I, it was not a, it was not a fun. It was not. It, I was trying to impress girls, and that was not how you did it. So I was like uh, talking to my professor about this fear I had of spiders, and he was suggesting, you know, maybe some kosher therapy or something like that to try and overcome that fear. Uh, and pretty much the way the dorms they had pretty strict rules with a lot of stuff uh when, especially when it came to having pets in there and you couldn't have heater i mean it was the way it worked out you could have like a betta fish or a tarantula it was like the only thing we could find at the pet store that we were allowed to have without breaking the rules technically so i got a tarantula uh, it was a rose-haired tea and it just kind of uh just kept it in like a 10 gallon aquarium on my desk and my roommate hated it uh he, he was not a fan of that at all so uh but it kind of it i, I would take it when i was studying because i mean back then there, we had the internet but I, I didn't realize i don't even know if there were like websites with care and husbandry advice so everything i learned i learned from the guy at the pet store that sold it to me uh and for the most part what he told me was uh, similar but he didn't say anything about not handling it. So I would take it out of the enclosure and just kind of let it crawl over me while I was studying on the couch or something like that. Um, <laughs> just, you know, and, and as I, the more I, l I learned about tarantulas, you know, the, the more I began to respect them and, and understand their needs are not exactly what my needs would be, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they don't, they don't appreciate being handled. They don't, there's a lot of things that I was doing that was stressing them out on, and I really shouldn't have been doing that, but you know, when I was starting out, I didn't really know much. And I moved a lot after that. I, I, I mean, I lived, I was from like Alaska to Florida. It just kind of everywhere I went, I had like my box of CDs and my tarantula. And that was just kind of, just became like my uh, partner in crime. And, you know, I, I ended up, uh, ended up in living in Florida and that tarantula had passed away. Uh, it just, you know, died of old age. And, I was kind of bummed about it, you know, because I had had it for so long. And my girlfriend at the time went and got another tarantula and I had that one for a long time. So it was, I, I just had like, you know, the, your basic rose hair tarantulas um, for pretty much my adult life. And then probably about ooh, five or six years ago, um, I got engaged and we got a house and I like actually started putting down roots and was uh, we had bought a gecko for my stepson and they had a little tiny you know, little baby tight, tiny spiderling there. And I was like, oh, I, I want another tarantula. So I got that. 
And I was like, I don't, I've never taken one care of one this small. So I got to find out, you know, how to, how to do this. And I started searching online and lo and behold, there were dozens of websites that are selling all kinds of tarantulas that I didn't even know existed. And that kind of just set off this, you know, uh, oh, I want to try that one. I want to try that one. And one tarantula became 10 tarantulas and then 10 became 20. And, you know, I, it just started growing, growing that way. Uh, especially after my dad passed away, I was kind of like my way of working through that was taking care of tarantulas and learning more about tarantulas and building enclosures. I mean, it was something that I could do. It was like a form of meditation, really, you know, just like building yeah. the enclosures and, and taking care of them and, and kind of work through a lot of stuff that way. And, and, and it's just, it's grown from there. Very cool. Yeah. I, I totally know what you mean about a form of meditation. That's how I feel when I'm taking care of my critters. That's, I get that, that you get in that zone. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <understand> that. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. So this actually leads to a question. One of our, uh, one of my Patreon uh, patrons had about uh, tarantula slings because you were saying that taking care of a sling, you hadn't taken care of one that small before. Can you mm -hmm. give us a kind of an overview of how you'd start out? If you're starting out with a tarantula spiderling, what would you do? What would be the basic care regimen? I mean, I know different species are going to have different uh, care requirements, but just kind of a general guide on that. Sure. Um, uh, one, I mean, one thing that I like to do is find an enclosure that's appropriate for the size of the tea. Um, I've made the mistake a few times of I, I get a tiny little spiderling and I want to put it in the cool adult enclosure that I got. And that is just, it's not practical. Um, mainly one, you don't really, you can't keep track of it. You don't know where it's going to be. You don't know if it's eating. The second, the, the ventilation in larger enclosures are actually, uh, about the size of the tarantula, like the spiderling's carapace, and it can just squeeze right through those and disappear in your house. So uh, one thing I always suggest to people is make sure you get an enclosure with tiny ventilation holes. You know, you don't want it to be any larger than the carapace, you know, smaller than the carapace of the, which, you know, like the head of the tarantula, the, where its eyes are. And, uh, right. you know, cause I've seen it so many times that it's happened to me. Uh, a lot of people in my Facebook group and stuff like that have, have had similar experiences where, I put it in an enclosure that maybe had been a little too big. Maybe it was you know, for juveniles or something, but those ventilation holes were just a little too wide and the, the sling was it. Then they could be escape artists. So uh, that was the first thing I would suggest is make sure you got it in a small, appropriate size enclosure with tiny ventilation holes. You know, tarantulas don't breathe that much. Really, when they move is really the only time they need to breathe. So they, you know, they, they don't have, it, more of the ventilation is for air circulation, keeping it from getting too humid and, and, and musky and, you know, just, you just want some, some good airflow in there. So make sure, you know, that, that, and then the substrate, usually I keep mine for spiderlings a little more on the damp side. Uh, cause especially tiny spiderlings don't have that waxy coating that kind of keeps mm -hmm. them, you know, some of that hydration in. So, you know, I, I like to keep it a little bit more on the humid side, like not like, m m not like a swamp, you know, not a swampy kind of texture, but just a, a little damp. So, you know, you don't have to worry about them drying out. Right. No, oh, that makes sense. And so, uh, I guess a lot of the differences for spiderlings would be like, just to sum up what you said, ventilation hold these to be small enough so that they can't fit their carapace through it. And then mm -hmm. humidity needs to be a little higher because they're more subject to desiccation. Yeah. And cool. people ask me a lot about feeding them. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, spiderlings are scavengers, so you can just, you know, cut up a worm or drop in cricket legs and they'll eat that. You don't have to worry about getting the, mm -hmm. the tiniest pinhead crickets or, you know, sometimes those can be a little different. If you only have one or two spiderlings, it, it can be a, a pain to have that many tiny feeders that you're not going to use all of them. Right. Oh, that's a nice, nice tip. So just cricket parts or mealworm parts would be just fine. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any picky species that won't go for that? Or is it just pretty much everything that you've kept? Mm, yeah. As far as like my spiderlings are never really picky, <laughs> you know, occasionally like uh, the fauna pelvis species can be a little, they can go on hunger strikes, even as tiny slings where they just won't eat for long periods of time. But mm -hmm. uh, once they're hungry, I, I can't think of anything that a tarantula has ever turned down. Cool. Well, what would you say? Um, I, we've got a couple of questions showing up on the, sure. um, the chat here that maybe I should try to catch some of these. Um, so all hail queen pissy says, 
um, that the uh, Phonopelma semeni is very, very mean. Is this normal? <laughs> <laughs> it can be. Um, mine, my spiderlings and juveniles, I pretty much never see them. They burrow deep down in their enclosure and pretty much stay there. My adult is, it can, she can be a little um, feisty, but sometimes that has to do with the way you have the enclosure set up. They really like to burrow deep. Uh, I mean, I don't think they're technically a fossorial tarantula, but they kind of act that way. So if, you, if you're not giving them a, like a whole lot of substrate to dig into, then their burrow kind of becomes just, you know, the floor of the enclosure and they become kind of defensive. When you open up that lid to drop in some crickets or water to them, it's kind of like you rip the top off their hide, you know, so, and it freaks them out and you're invading their space in that way. A lot of trick like OBTs are like that as well. So, you know, if you give it plenty of room to, to burrow and hide and kind of somewhere to escape, they usually aren't as defensive. Ah, because they don't feel like they're being their territory is being invaded, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So let's see. So the formal top hat would like to know what the most dangerous tarantula you've handled is. Oh, um, I, I, I am kind of. I'm not like a thrill seeker when it comes to that kind of stuff, so I don't <laughs> go out of my way to handle highly venomous tarantulas. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know if it really counts, but uh, my Postlotheria metallica, when it was a juvenile, during a rehousing, kind of ran up on my arm. And I got my heart beating, even though it was a small tarantula. But you know, yeah. it wasn't like I was handling it for fun. It just kind of was a it, – it jumped out on me, and I just had to kind of calmly deal with that situation, get it into its new enclosure. Yeah, so it was an incidental handling, not, not a exactly. purposeful yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So um, – Again, all hell queen pissies act, asking if it's a good idea to handle an Aphonopelma semeni. I actually made uh, a whole video on handling tarantulas. Um, mm -hmm. For the most part, it doesn't matter what species it is. That's it's not. I personally, I don't. It's not something that the tarantula is going to enjoy. You know, it, it might be mm -hmm. some of them might tolerate it, might let you handle it. Um, and you know, and some people find that very therapeutic and relaxing. Um, I enjoy occasionally, there's a few species that I do enjoy handling, mm -hmm. uh, but something like the, the Afana Pelma Simani that not really known to be, a, a social tarantula, if that's a thing, you know, they're, they're, they don't tolerate as much as some other species like the Afana, Afana Pelma calcodes, the desert blonde tarantula or Arizona blonde tarantula. It's, they are very laid back. So mine never really seems to to kind of mind that um, some rose hairs are like that Grimmistola pulchres, you know, there are a lot of like Labrador dogs or, you know, kind of just sweet docile tarantulas in the hobby. But even that varies, you know, they, they have different uh, moods and personalities. It's something that, especially when you get a lot of tarantulas, you start to realize like generality for the species, but within that species, some of them will be cool with it and some of them won't. And like after a molt, sometimes, you know, th that'll change as well. Okay. I have heard about that, that a molt, sometimes they'll come out and they'll just have a totally different personality than they did before, so to speak. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, so um, Arthropod Ambassadors wants to know if you've ever had issues with like bad feeders, like maybe pet store crickets or something, like dirty feeders that have made any of your teeth sick. Luckily, no. I've, I've I've heard people having issues with maybe mites coming in on roaches or crickets, but that's not something I've ever had to deal with. Yeah, oh, that's good. Um, okay, formal top hat is asking if you've ever had a species that had a really hard time getting, um, just basically difficult to obtain species that you either you don't have still because you haven't been able to source it, or that you finally got. <laughs> um, for a long time, my unicorn was uh, the Brachypelma albiceps. Um, I, for whatever reason, I just I really enjoyed that kind of golden red rub tarantula. It, you know, the carapace is kind of this like goldish tan color, and the rest of it's kind of black, and it just looked really sharp to me. And I, I just I couldn't find one. Uh, finally, I ended up stumbling onto a bunch of them. Right now, I would have to say it's the uh, Therophosanae species Panama, which is the, uh, they call it the lava tarantula. It's a gorgeous specimen, and usually when they become available, they sell out within a few days. So there's oh, wow. a lot of people trying to get them and breed them, and 
Uh, I have a friend who apparently had a successful egg sack, so now I'm just kind of waiting <laughs> for her to give me the heads up that they're for sale. Cool. So with tarantulas, uh, how many young ballpark figure would you expect from a sack, and does that depend on species and so on? It does. Yeah, it really depends on species. Um, I, I don't. I don't do a whole lot of breeding, so I'm like the expert here. But I know like um, like Canthoscuria geniculata or Nondochromatus or some of these larger Brazilian species can have you know a thousand uh, eggs. You know, there, there could be a, a whole lot of spiderlings, um, which is generally why they are so readily available in the hobby and inexpensive. But then there are some other ones like uh, T. Celadonia. Uh, species like that that are uh, they don't have very many babies you know they when they have an egg sac maybe there's like 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. so it definitely influences supply and demand for a lot of species then it does yeah so hd arachnids wants to know when you're pairing arboreal teas do you prefer the shark tank method or introducing the male to the female enclosure and monitoring the whole process <laughs> Now, I've, I've only bred arboreals once, and that was a uh, Vicularia species, and it was not successful. So she never broke an egg. Um, but the way I did it was I just introduced a male into her enclosure. Okay. Cool. Let's see. Um, so Ken of the Kaiju Isu channel would, and he's the same one who had the question about raising uh, slings. How long could a sling go without eating? Oh, wow. Uh, it depends on the species, really. Um, a lot of your New World terrestrials, like uh, like fall palmas, brocky palmas, um, gramistolas. Like, for instance, I have an afauna palma. Uh, I think it was actually a samani, um, if I remember correctly. I have to go over and look. But it went about six months without eating. Wow. Uh, and so uh, one way you can avoid that is to not overfeed them. You know, if, if you start overfeed them, you know, essentially they'll get full and, and just will burrow down and hide until they're ready to molt. You know, so they can disappear for months at a time that way. Hmm. So overfeeding can get them to kind of go torpid a little bit. To digest. Yeah, I think a lot of people come from the reptile hobby and, and are thinking powerful. Like maybe the faster I feed it, the higher its metabolism will be and the faster it'll grow. But branches, it doesn't quite seem to work that way. There are other variables and factors you got to take into consideration. Yeah, that makes sense. So Rocky, Might Rocky Mountain Spider Freaks would like to know if you have experience with villocella maturing. I have a male that has matured this molt and a female that I'm not sure has matured. Do you know if they mature respective? Mm, okay, that's as far as the comment went. So <laughs> what's up, Rocky? Good to see you. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I've got a few villocellas. But neither one of them are. I think maybe one of them is is matured. She's a female. But with most species, they males almost always uh, mature before the females. That makes sense. Let's see. I'm trying to catch up on all these things. Okay, Albatross Gaming wants to know if feeding tomato worms for tarantulas is a good idea. Is that safe? Uh, I think it would depend on the size of the tarantula. Like personally, I have done that. If by tomato worms, I assume you're talking about like green horn worms. Like horn worms, like I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I feed those to my larger teas, like uh, Theraphosa sturmi or Blondi, uh, some of my Pamphibia species. I wouldn't do it to a you know. I, I would make sure that the tarantula is substantially larger uh, than the horn worm. Mm -hmm. But I have had no problems with it. Okay. Cool. So, formal top hat wants to know if there are any tarantulas you don't enjoy, like you wouldn't keep or would rather not keep. Oh man, that's that's tough. Um, tarantulas I don't enjoy. I this is going to be unpopular. Uh, I get a lot of requests for um, Heterospoda maculata, the uh, HMAC tarantula, and I am not a huge like. I think it's a beautiful black and white tarantula, but it's fast and it's venomous and they hide a lot. I don't really like I have three three or four of them like I never ordered it I was like I never want to keep that tarantula and uh, it just seems that sometimes when you order tarantulas especially getting more than a, a few they'll throw in a freebie and that seems to always be the freebie that I get <laughs> <laughs> another HMAC so uh, they're they're slowly growing um, so I'm going to do a video on them soon 
but that's that's one I'm I'm not too crazy about that and uh, another one that people ask a lot about but the the King Baboon Tarantula and I'm not a fan of that one just mainly just because it's such a fervent fossorial like it, it burrows down to the bottom of the enclosure and then you never see it it's, it just seems like it's just a you're key feeding uh, an enclosure full of dirt so it's a pet hole <laughs> exactly <laughs> Okay. Is there a species, all hail Queen Pissy wants to know if there's a species that you've never owned that you would be scared of owning? Hmm. Uh, maybe not of tarantulas. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with all the tarantulas I have right now. Uh, there are some uh, like huntsman spiders, um, uh, some Australian species that, you know, can be pretty venomous. Like pretty much anything that can send you to the hospital. I think like there's some species of scorpions and stuff, uh, some venomous snakes that, you know, I, 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 I'm a little scared of having. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. My, I remember we've, I think talked about this somewhere that our wives will not permit us to keep roaches. <laughs> yeah. And very true. Yeah. For, for me, uh, the three stipulations she made were no roaches, no tarantulas. So I'm really glad to have you on the show so you can, you know, round that out a bit and nothing with sure. medically significant venom. Yeah. That was the deal. So, um, it works, but, uh, it's nice that you can be here and kind of fill in the tarantula gaps for us. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I actually, I tried to sneak some roaches in the house. Uh, I think it was actually arthropod ambassadors sent me some, um, mm -hmm. and somebody else did me. And so I, I ended up with some and was like, they're, I just, I just, I guess I didn't think she would notice. <laughs> it's like, she doesn't come down here too much. So I, I kind of just kept them, you know, for a few months. And then my son ratted me out. <laughs> it was like, oh, have you seen these cool roaches? And she was like, excuse me? What? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> so Tarantula Cribs wants to know if you keep any isopods in your tarantula enclosures. Um... I do in a few. I, I have a bioactive setup for my, th like my, I've got like a large Theraphosa Sturmy, and I do have some small dwarf isopods in there. Other than that, though, I think it's pretty much just all spring tails. I'm trying to think. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of bioactives right now for my tarantulas. It's mainly like my snakes and reptiles, um, just because it makes cleaning a lot easier. <laughs> You know, they can be a lot messier than tarantulas. Um, I'm planning on doing some in the future, but do actually doing some research right now on how isopods and tarantulas cohabitate. Because for a long time, it seemed like that was, um, you know, uh, not an issue. But lately, the people have been, you know, reporting that maybe the isopods are attacking tarantulas, especially during molting and stuff. So, just been talking to some people and, and trying to, you know, get to the bottom of that and find out exactly what the situation is. Yeah, but yeah. Before the I haven't had any issues. Okay. Yeah, I think that would probably depend on species of tarantula and also species of isopod because some isopods are so voracious and others are, you know, a little bit more careful about what they eat and stuff. So I think that would probably have some bearing on it. Um, yeah. By I the way, pretty much all my knowledge on isopods has come from watching your channel. Ah, <laughs> cool. You're my go-to source. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you. Um, you know, the, the unboxing that you did of tarantula cribs enclosures, maybe was that like a month ago or something? Yeah, um, yeah, about a month ago. I When I saw those, I thought those could make some really sweet display enclosures for isopods too. If you have like, oh, uh, that's a good idea. Like a colorful species you want to show off a little bit with those magnetic closures and everything. The ventilation yeah. looks really sweet. So I want to try that out sometime. I'll definitely have to do that. I need to get some colorful species. Like all yeah. mine are pretty bland. <laughs> But well, I didn't like you know, I didn't spend a lot of money on them at first. You know, I wanted to try right. some more of the basic species, make sure I, I could actually keep them successfully. Yeah, which is smart. But if you want to try out something, let me know. I can hook you up. I so. will. Cool. Definitely. Um, oh, yeah. Dixie Normus is talking about the reception. And I have to apologize, everyone. Um, we had huge windstorms in my area, like crazy windstorms, unheard, unprecedented. And trees were falling all over. And... Uh, power lines and everything. I lost my internet. So right now I'm on data. <laughs> uh, so that's why this is not ideal. Um, I would normally have this on a landline, uh, 
you know, going through um, lend connection to make sure we have a good uh, quality. But this is what we got today. I can't, they weren't fixing yeah. it. And so. the software that we're using, you look nice and sharp and you sound fine. Yeah. But then when I, I look at what's being broadcast on uh, Facebook or on YouTube, it, we're both a little pixelated. <laughs> a little pixelated, yeah. And it, that'll probably, um, once they process it, for the people who are watching it later, probably look better. But I guess it doesn't look now. Uh, doesn't look that great right now. So uh, let's see. Catching up here. Just close your eyes and pretend it's a podcast. Yeah, yeah, it kind of is. So <laughs> <laughs> go with that. So basement pets want to know how often you feed your adult tarantulas versus your slings and how that differs between species. All right. Um, spiderlings, I feed a lot more often, at least once a week, so, especially right after a molt. Sometimes I'll feed them twice a week. Uh, some of my adult tarantulas maybe get fed once a month. So it's that's that's why I think I'm it's it's so easy for somebody to grow such a large tarantula collection, especially mm -hmm. as adults. Like you know, you you only have to feed them you know maybe once every two to three weeks, sometimes four or five weeks. It's very yeah, they're very sense. low maintenance. <laughs> just keep the water, yeah. you're, you're good to go. Yeah, and I guess this the slings just have a little bit of a higher metabolism when they're younger. Yeah, that's probably it. And you got to they're a lot more. Um, uh, I can't get the word uh, susceptible to environmental issues. So I don't like overdo it, but I, I check on them every few days. Just make sure the humidity is good and they're doing okay. And if they're looking thin, I'll, I'll drop in a little bit more food. If they're looking plump, I'll, I'll skip feeding and, and see if they're going to molt soon. I'm, I'm, I dote on them a little bit, a lot more actually than, you know, the larger tarantulas. They're, they're pretty much self-sufficient. As long as I feed them once a month, they're, they're happy. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So um, All Hail Queen Pissy would like to know if a tarantula were to try to bite someone while they're, the tarantula is sitting on your arm and tries to bite you, they just out of the blue, like they don't seem stressed or angry or anything, and then all of a sudden they start to try to bite you. What, what would you do in a case like that? Well, I mean, what I would like to think I would do is remain calm. Like there's no way I'm going to be faster than that tarantula. So if it's decided it's going to bite me, all I can do is take the bite um the worst thing you could do is to react um you know and fling your arm or something like that that's most assuring that you're gonna really harm or possibly even kill a tarantula right so you know anytime that that's kind of where the meditation uh part comes in like the mindfulness mm -hmm. that i i find a lot of relief from when i'm dealing or you know interacting with my tarantulas is is i, I really gotta like know exactly what's, what's happening, you know, be completely in the moment and know, all right, this is what the tarantula is doing. These are the possibilities of what can happen. I need to remain calm if something unexpected happens. Uh, Cause you know, it, the, I, I don't want to be the person that panics and, and flings their hand and tosses a tarantula across the room. Right. Right. Like you said, that's a good way to make sure the tarantula gets harmed. So yeah, that's awesome. I think, um, have you ever had that experience where you suddenly get bitten? You just have to sit there and take it. I have never been bit by a tarantula. Uh, I mean, all the years dealing with it, um, and I think a lot of that has to it comes from just being like being mindful in the moment and giving the tarantula space. Like, my favorite thing to do, which I think is like the best piece of advice you can give anybody, especially with large adult tarantulas, is just gently tap on the enclosure before you open it. Like just that little heads up, that little warning. If they're not cool with you coming, like, get in their space, they're usually going to retreat and hide and and be out of danger's way. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense. So it's kind of like working with snakes that way. You give them a heads yeah, up. Probably. Yeah. And you, you're going to feed them so they know the difference between, oh, this is a feeding, this is not. And that may not apply to tarantulas so much, but they get that little heads up, you're coming. Right. You don't want to spook them. <laughs> they don't, yeah. They don't, know. They, don't, they don't handle startle very well. Yeah, that makes sense. So Jordan, another... Uh, uh, patron is asking if you have a favorite substrate for your teas. Oh man. Um, I mean, you could ask my wife, there's like a menagerie of substrates in the garage. <laughs> I mean, I got cocoa fiber, peat moss, um, the creature soil, the jungle mix. Uh, I mean, all, all kinds of, uh, different companies, you know, I, I pretty much try everybody's substrate, try to figure out, you know, what, what works best. And it really, seems to be dependent on the species like i have kind of a substrate that i like more for the moisture dependent species and for the arid species you know 
I'm I'm starting to move away a little bit from cocoa fiber. I mean, it's mm -hmm. so cheap and so easy to deal with, but it's just it's caused so many problems, just mainly with mushrooms and dust. Oh. Um, and and I, I, it's effective and inexpensive. You know, it works and it's cheap, but I don't think it's as visually pleasing as a lot of other substrates that are out there. Um, lately, I would see the. Uh, I think it's the Zoomed creature soil I've enjoyed um, and the jungle mix. I don't remember who makes that. If you're just looking for something to get at a pet store. Uh, and then you can mix a little peat moss or, you know, a little bit of sand or something like that in there to kind of mix it up a little bit and you know, tailor it to whatever species that you're, uh, you're trying to use it for. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, Wally of Supreme Gecko wants to know if you've ever seen really large naturalistic enclosures set up with other animals as a primary exhibit. So some kind of gecko or other lizard with tarantulas mm -hmm. as another inhabitant in that same enclosure. Does that ever work? Have people tried that? Mm, I, not to my knowledge. Uh, I've never seen that. I mean, I've seen enclosures like that, but not with a tarantula cohabitating with other species. Um, like, I, I don't, I think that in the wild, tarantulas are pretty, they, they enjoy their solitude. You know, they spend a lot of time kind of hidden out. Um, and they eat, I mean, they're opportunistic feeders. So they'll try to eat whatever kind of, I mean, they don't go out hunting for food, you know, like like reptiles and stuff will. They don't travel vast distances to grab a meal. They usually would just sit in their burrow, conserve energy and wait for something to cross their path. So I think right. in, in that kind of communal would it would be kind of dangerous. Like whatever you put in there with a tarantula is a, is possible food. That's why there's only a few, like really uh, a few species of tarantulas that can even live communally amongst themselves, uh, let alone, you know, something, you know, like a, like a, a reptile or something. Right. That kind of makes sense. If it's small enough for the tarantula to eat, it's fair game. And if it's large enough to eat the tarantula, the tarantula is fair game, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, there, there have been reports of some species in the wild that live, like cohabitate with certain species of frogs uh, because they have kind of like a symbiotic relationship. But I, I have a feeling that it's uh, it's going to be pretty secluded to just that species of tarantula mm -hmm. with that species of frog in that environment. Okay. I don't know if it's something you could replicate, but maybe. Maybe. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that's that's a great answer to that question, I think. Um, so the formal top hat wants to know if there's ever been a pet that you regret purchasing. Mm. Pet I regret purchasing. Uh, I when I was I was getting some scorpions once, and the guy offered me a Death Stalker scorpion, and I thought that sounded kind of cool. Um, it, I was a little intimidated by it with the venom potency, but I kind of felt like uh, I can handle it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and so I was like, sure, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. But then once I got it, I was, I kind of like, before I even got it, I, I was starting to regret that decision. Like it's already in the mail, but I don't know if that was a good idea. And my wife definitely didn't think it was a good idea. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not sure which, um, it had issues. Like when I, when it got delivered, it would, uh man i can't think of the word right now but essentially it'd been kept too humid um uh, it's not desiccation but whatever the other word is it's escaping me at the moment so we didn't live very long it, okay it, it got too humid is that what you said yeah some of the some of the scorpions have to be in like a very arid environment if there's too much humidity uh it's it's almost like it's kind of like mold starts growing on them and, oh like mycosis uh, mycosis that's it thank you mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that um, that makes sense because I've um, heard of that with kind of a lot of arachnids can have that issue. Centipedes as well, not just arachnids, but um, so um, like I keep tailless whip scorpions, and that can be an issue with them, and mm. so on. So yeah, and I know that centipedes as well as uh, and probably some other inverts can deal with that as well. So Jordan Safala would like to know if you do live streams on your channel. I do, um, maybe once a month, okay. sometime around then. Uh, and then I also, usually uh, Saturday nights, um, there's a group of tarantula YouTubers. Uh, most of them are in the UK. 
it's what they call it uh, oh I'm killing you if I don't remember it. Saturday night oh tarantula two tarantula two Saturday night takeaway. That's what it's called. And <laughs> it's pretty much like we're doing right now. And there'll be like four, five or six people like all just a live stream conversation. And I think it'll probably do it for four or five hours sometimes. But it's it's, it's enjoyed. So I hop in on it sometimes. It's the closest I get to like hanging out with people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I got the gist of that. It was a little bit laggy on my end when you were saying that, but I, I oh. got the gist of it. Um, okay. I hope everybody else was here and I hope that was just on my end, but um, I did get most of it. Um, so Dixie Normus wants to know if a tarantula enclosure can be overrun by springtails. I, I Not to my knowledge. No, I, I think... Again, I guess it, it really do. tarantulas don't produce that much waste, you know, and, mm -hmm. and springtails kind of need that to feed off of. So right. I think that if the population of springtails gets too high, the, their food source would become depleted and they'll probably kind of die off and it's kind of the numbers would kind of manage themselves. Usually the yeah. issue is keeping the springtails alive in the enclosure, not mm -hmm. getting too many of them. Well, that makes sense. Like I sometimes have to add little supplements and stuff into my bioactives just so they have enough to kind of to feed on. Yeah, I've had to do that in some of my enclosures too, just because you get something like a mantis or whatever, and the waste it produces is really not a ton. And so, yeah, some supplemental food, that makes sense. Oh, and Diane just has a comment saying that we are both her go-tos when doing research for a new invert or tar other tarantula, uh, tarantula or other invert. So that's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank, Thank you, Diane. And, oh, tarantula cribs picked up some isopods, some zebras, dalmatians, and powder oranges. The NARBC, that's awesome. And oh, I wish I could have gone to that. Yeah, I'm missing reptile expos, I'll tell you that. Yeah. They just announced they're having one uh, in Pittsburgh, which I'm like right outside Pittsburgh. Uh, they've been canceling it over and over again. They announced it's going to be going on and very tempted to go. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Supreme Gecko is mentioning that the, the tap on the enclosure or tap on the back of a gecko works the same way that it does for tarantulas um, to kind of give them that heads up you're coming. Very and cool. the formal top hat wants to know how he can grow a beard like yours. <laughs> um, eat, eat your vegetables. <laughs> Vitamins. <laughs> yep. Um, I could grow a beard like yours if my wife would let me, but she wants me to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had the, a beard like this for, oh, I don't even know how long. Probably, I've had a beard since I could grow a beard. Uh, but growing it long, probably about, I want to say maybe eight years ago, something like that, before I met my wife. So she only knew me. It was actually longer. Uh, it was it was probably, you know, I mean, I don't want to over-exaggerate, but it was longer. And uh, right before we got married, uh, like maybe four days before our actual ceremony. Uh, she had always said she wanted to see what I look like. So I just, I mean, I didn't shave completely, but I trimmed it all like super short, like down to the skin. Freaked wow. her out. <laughs> <laughs> and now she knows. And then I grew back and never went back. <laughs> <laughs> so Arthur Pod Ambassadors wants to know, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce this one, but it says, has, I had an adult male N- Insay, is that how you say that? Mm hmm. In with some death's head roaches that worked out. Insay. Oh, that's okay. very interesting. Yeah, that is. I, I wouldn't have known. That's cool. And um, Rocky Mountain Spider Freaks, they had a cohabitation with a frog and a tarantula that didn't go well. So, um, so all Hill Queen Pissy caught a male Texas brown tarantula who has matured. And wants to know if releasing it back into the wild after a few days with of keeping it was a good decision. Um, probably, yeah. Um, I mean, was it, um, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, was it a male when you, like she captured uh, it that was wild, I, it was out in the wild? I think so. It said it was a male who has matured. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it was one that you raised yourself, like you bought a sling and it matured male and you let it go in the wild, um, I, don't, I don't think that would really harm the ecosystem that much. Um, 
So I don't know. But if you just found one in your backyard and you brought it inside and then you put it back outside, I don't think that'll mess with it at all. That makes sense. I think it'll be fine. Okay, let's see. I see Tarantula Havens in here. What's going on, Alex? So Arthur Potter Ambassadors is asking if you have in your Balfari communal, how many teas do you have in there? Um, the, I was going to try and show them to you, but as soon as I touch that enclosure, they're all run right now. I've got, I've got four, <laughs> I have four in Balfouris in there. Cool. I, I love the idea of communal setups for just about anything that can actually do that well. So, uh, tarantulas, anything else, if it's communal, I think it's awesome. I, a lot of the species that I get, yeah. you know. and they're, they're a beautiful species. Like I have one, uh, it's almost an adult and I, it, it was cost prohibitive. It's just, they can be very expensive. Um, so getting communal going can uh, set you back a little bit. Uh, I kind of was in a situation where I pretty much traded goods and services and was able to get one from a dealer. And I, I was pretty excited about that. And they've they've been thriving. Like I haven't had any issues at all. They really seem to kind of just co coexist very well. When you have a communal going like that, is breeding just sort of straightforward? Do they just do it? You don't have to worry about it? From what I understand, it seems to be the case. Um, I, 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 the issue with it is usually when you get them, they're all sack mates. Like if you're getting a communal from somebody, uh, it's because they, they had a successful sack and you're buying like 10 of them. Uh, the problem comes in that the males are going to mature way before the females are ready. So that kind of leads to, you know, they're just kind of missing each other. <laughs> like the males yeah. end up maturing and dying before the females are ready to breed. Um, not always, but that, that seems to be the case. But if, if you're going from multiple sacks and, and you kind of line it up well, it seems like they uh, they, they breed pretty well. Cool. So Jordan Savala would like to know from both of us, if we keep log books to monitor when you feed water, mist, and you know just maintain. Do you want to go first? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> in, instead of having um, a log book, I have a schedule on the wall because my kids all, um, you know, make some pocket money by helping me take care of things. And so I just have it on a schedule like Tuesday and Thursday. This is when these enclosures get watered and whatever is on the wall and you feed on Monday and Wednesday or whatever it is, you know. Um, so that's how that works. It's a schedules on the wall and uh, they know what to look for at each child has their own particular purview what they're taking care of so it works out pretty well that's brilliant <laughs> i need i need children <laughs> <laughs> um i actually kind of do the same thing but it's just me brilliant. like i uh i just kind of get into a routine i have like i know i get off work on mondays and i come home and and this is what needs to do i check on these slings and i feed these juveniles on this shelf and i kind of break it up like that um, and like my day off, usually the morning is, is just kind of clean and maintain any kind of rehousings I need to do or anything like that. That's the opportunity to do that. Like usually like my wife's day off as well. And, and her and the kid kind of sleep in so I can sneak down the basement and, you know, put on a podcast or some music and just do what needs to get done. Yeah. Um, yeah app on my phone. Uh, it's, uh, I, it was called just tarantula and now it's like exotic keeper or something like that. Um, I think it's only on Android phones, though. It's not something you can get on iPhone, I, I don't believe. But it you can put the species and I like the genus species. When you got it, keep track of its molts, when you watered it, when it uh, last fed. I mean, it's it works really well, especially if you've got like 10 or 20 tarantulas. When you've got this many tarantulas, I found I was spending more time entering information to the app than you know actually doing what needed to be done. So for me, just kind of getting in a, a routine works a lot better. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. That's I've tried using apps like that, and I've found the same thing that it just takes too much time. But like, my kids don't do all the maintenance. There's a lot that I do too, and like, I'll have my Wednesday and and uh, Saturday are my snake feeding days, for example. And um, Saturdays the do I do water changes on my aquariums and things like that. So um, that's kind of how I do it too. I have certain days when I do certain things. Very cool. So, let's see. Um, Sorry, I just uh, flipped the the chat the wrong direction, and now I'm trying to catch up and see where we are. <laughs> um, 
And I know I'm going to miss some of your comments, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm just doing what I can, and I appreciate all of them, but uh, see what we can do. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, there's a question. How can I, from All Hail Queen Pissy, how can I convince my mother to let me get more tarantulas without telling her I'm addicted? <laughs> um, I don't know if it's responsible for me to <laughs> to answer. <laughs> Can't teach people to manipulate their parents. <laughs> Um, I think one thing I'll tell you how I convinced my wife is uh, I, I pretty much told her like, you know, it, it, tarantulas are very easy to take care of for one, like, very little maintenance. Uh, they don't make a mess. They're, you know, the care, like they don't, you, it's really a, a big electrical bill that comes with them. You don't have to have heating pads and lights and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and also that they, they're a lot of fun when they're out in the open, but when they go into pre-molt, they'll, they'll go and hide and you won't see them for weeks or months. And that's usually when I found myself like, okay, it's time to get another tarantula because now I'm just staring at an enclosure full of dirt. So you <laughs> stagger it like that way, convince her that, you know, it, it's hiding. You need to get another one. I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. I just lost. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm touching the screen in the wrong way somehow. Well, thank you, Tarantula Haven, for the shout out to me and Wally. They they like our, our channels for non-tarantula invert info. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, do you think Albatross Gaming is wondering if they're, they're going to move to might go move to a place where they could catch tarantulas in the wild on their property? How do you feel about collecting wild no wild collecting tarantulas? Do you think that's okay, or do you think that can be a problem, or does it depend? Uh, I'm not like a ecologist or biologist or anything like that. So, I mean, I can only tell you my opinion. Uh, and personally, I, it's not, I think it's fun to go out into nature. I mean, I enjoy like one of our, the big things our family does is go on hikes, you know, whether it's in, it's in Arizona or just here in West Virginia or, you know, wherever we go, that's something we always know is going to be uh, on the schedule is we're going to go hike out in the woods somewhere. Um, I find all kinds of cool bugs and, and, you know, just very interesting wildlife out there. Um, but I always leave it there. You know, I, I think that if it's surviving and thriving there, that's what, that's the best place for it to be. So I personally don't take things out of the wild. Um, the tarantulas, it kind of depends on the species and the location, but you know, a lot of them are struggling to survive. And if you're finding a tarantula on your property, it's usually a male that's looking to breed. So by scooping that guy up, and taking it out of there, you could be, you know, essentially denying its ability to mate with a female that could produce, you know, produce hundreds of slings. You know, you're taking that guy out of circulation. Usually, the females they're they're going to stay in their little tiny location, you know, their little burrow. They're not going to venture out much. So, um, it seems that that's the case. Is you know, in a situation like that, especially if, if you're in the U.S., I think most of our tarantulas here. Are, you know, they're, they're all pretty much the same in their behaviors. So when you come across one walking across your property, it's it's a mature male looking to breed. Mm -hmm. And then, two, if you are catching a mature male, not only are you denying that mature male the chance to reproduce, but it's not going to live very long after you catch it, is it? No, I, that's very true. So it's not not a lose lose situation, really. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of like the big controversies. I'm not sure about you know other inverts, but I know in the tarantula hobby, wild caught teas, um, it, it, it's a hot topic. It's a it's a hot button issue because you know we want to be a responsible and respectable uh, kind of kind of hobby, and we want to work with researchers, scientists, and, and things like that. And when people sneak out to the jungles and and you know, capture wild caught specimens, you know, without the correct paperwork and you know, essentially smuggle them out of the country and, um, you know, smuggle them into other countries and breed them all just for financial gain. It, it makes us look bad. You know, like there's a lot of species that have been discovered recently that are very cool and colorful and beautiful. And I'd really like to have them, but I also know that right now that's not a possibility. Like, you know, it, I, I want to get them, but I want it to be, you know, legal. I, I, so I try not to participate in, in the wild caught situation. Yeah. But I think that sense. might be more, tarantula based and i'm again i'm not sure i know a lot of the centipedes and scorpions that um i find for sale they all seem to be wild caught but they're also prolific breeders like <laughs> a lot of people treat them as pests 
Right, right. And it, and and some of the species, like there are a few terren- or centipede species that are fairly easy to capture breed, but there are quite a few that are commonly kept, but they're not commonly bred. But yeah, that makes sense. Um, so Evan Hewitt would like to know if wolf spiders make good pets and is the Brazilian wandering spider a type of tarantula? The Brazilian wandering spider is not a type of tarantula. Um, I think it's a megalomorph, but I'm not 100%. Um, what was the first part? Wolf spiders. Oh, wolf spiders. Uh, they good pets. I don't know. That's what started me on this whole journey. I was deadly afraid of wolf spiders, like uh, camping out, uh, you know, as a I guess Boy Scouts and stuff like that always seem to be a huge wolf spider in my tent and and not <laughs> like them. So I, I, I've i actually recently got a huntsman spider, uh, but as far as wolf spiders, I don't know. I, I have a few friends that have kept them. They seem to enjoy them, but for me, I like to keep, you know, tarantulas or spiders, I guess, that are either like really colorful or out on display a lot, or really large. So, you know, some wolf spiders, I mean, I, I've got like 20 in my base, like in the garage, if you want some. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't put them in enclosures. They just kind of, they're just here. <laughs> they're just there hanging out. Yeah. Okay. That's one problem. That I've, not a problem, but when I have everybody in the basement, like I keep the conditions optimal for tarantulas and inverts, and sometimes forget that, there are wild inverts that are really enjoying the optimal conditions that I've made. <laughs> when I was moving my entire collection, I was like, whoa, there was a lot of spiders living free range down behind these enclosures. I didn't even realize. Yeah. I Kitchen get that. I get that. Feeders. Yeah. I get that with the false black widows that show up. Um, I'm oh, glad wow. they're not real black widows, just the false ones. Yeah. <laughs> they show up behind my isopod enclosures and I'll open it or my daughter will say, Hey, come get this. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, the nice thing about living in West Virginia is there's, I, th- I don't think there are any venomous snakes here. There may be one, but like there's really no, there's really, it's, it's a bit, there's no venomous anything. <laughs> it's kind of safe when you go out in the woods, unlike you know, the Southwest and Florida and places like that. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. We, we find, I used to find lots of black widows here when I was a kid. I don't see them as much as I used to, but I used to see a lot. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so Diane Rodriguez says, I want to keep old worlds at some point, but my boyfriend is understandably nervous about having animals with potent venom in our home. Any advice for convincing him? Um, I think really the only way to convince, like really much the only way I can convince uh, my wife uh, when I was getting old worlds is showing that you're responsible uh, for the tarantulas you do have and educating. Like that seems to be the, the biggest way to win somebody over is kind of maybe to get them involved a little bit, teach them about tarantulas and tarantula behavior. And once they kind of realize that one, they're not aggressive, like they're not coming after you. Um, yeah, it's not like uh, there's some guy on TikTok that's always posting these videos of cobras and stuff that are, he just walks by the enclosure and they're trying to come at them. Uh, tarantulas aren't really like that. They're, they're defensive, but not aggressive. And the same goes is true with the old worlds. Like all the old worlds I have, for the most part, would much rather run and hide than you know. If they're giving me a threat pose and I'm in danger, that means I've done something wrong. You know, I've invaded their space. I haven't warned them. I my just husbandry is wrong, and they don't have a place to kind of run and hide. So it, once you can kind of educate somebody and teach them that, you know, the, the tarantula is always going to retreat before it tries to attack. Um, it kind of sets a lot of people at ease. No, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, let's see. Um, so just checking out here. Let's see. <laughs> can can someone call themselves a trencher collector if they only have two? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, because it probably means you're going to get more because you have room, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ernest Ham said Copperhead and Cottonmouth in West Virginia. No, I think I think it's the Copperhead and the Timber Rattler uh, are like the only ones. I have to Google it. I think they're like the only venomous snakes, but they're not that. 
common. I, I always think there's water moccasins or something like that every time we go in the lake, and my wife is quick to remind me that that is not the case. Mm -hmm. I spent too much time in Florida, though, I think. Like, I'm on guard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, oh, there was one I missed. Uh, I'm trying to go back and find it, but uh, sorry. I have a question for you. If you had three species of um, three species of tarantula that you would recommend as beginner species, what would they be? Um. I actually have a video on this as well. Like I, I think I narrowed it down to twenty species. Uh, but if if I had to do three, I think the top of the list, that fauna pema calcotes, the Arizona blonde tarantula, is just such a sweetheart. Always chilled, laid back. Uh, if you get it as a sling, though, they can take a very long. I mean, they live like over like thirty years, so they're very slow growing. So sometimes that can be frustrating. Uh, Grimmsnarl pulchra. Uh, it's the uh, Brazilian black tarantula, kind of known as like the black lab of the tarantula hobby. It's for the most part. Sometimes they can be a little uh, feisty, but yeah, for the most part, they're pretty chilled and relaxed. Um, and then the first tarantula I got, was the rose hair tarantula, like well, always Chilean rose hair, uh, Gramistola rosea or Gramistola prateri, it will always have a special place in my heart. Uh, I think those are great beginners. Um, and then if you if you want an arboreal tarantula, which you know like is tree dwelling tarantula, Avicularia avicularia is always a great place to start. They're pretty easy to take care of, um, and they're usually very inexpensive. Cool. All right, that sounds great. I think uh, my the one tarantula I've ever I babysat a tarantula for my sister in law, and she had a Chilean rose hair. My wife was okay nice. with babysitting for a few weeks, but that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Gia Show, thank you. Glad you're a, a fan and like to watch the channel. That's awesome. And let's see. Um, I'm trying to catch up here. Okay. Well, now the chat's acting funny. Um, you know, we're actually getting down to the time when we're supposed to wrap up. So I wanted to make sure I Already. gave you a chance. Yeah, it's gone fast and it's been fun. I wanted to make sure wow. to uh, give you a chance to, first of all, say anything you'd like to say that I kind of missed that might be good for people to hear about tarantulas. And then please give us your contact info in terms of if people want to subscribe to you, where do they go? What kind of social media are you most active on? All that kind of stuff where they can get <laughs> go to find out more, watch you more. Yeah. Uh what well, YouTube channel is the Tarantula Collective. Uh, I just, well, I'm about to, like it's set up, uh, but I'm launching a second channel called the Exotic Pet Collective because uh, I've got, you know, uh, scorpions and snakes and geckos and other things down here. And it seemed that I would make a video and people would get upset. Like we want videos about tarantulas. This is Tarantula Tuesday on the Tarantula Collective. And right. I, I kind of, I mean, you gotta agree with them. Like, I can't have tarantula <laughs> multiple times and be like, "Look, my leopard gecko." So I was like, "I'll just get a second channel and 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 do that." So that's going, and then I'm gonna start a podcast with uh, uh, on that channel. That'll be coming in very soon. Just kind of waiting on a few more things to come in in the mail, but essentially interviewing different breeders, dealers, uh, some scientists and therapists and researchers and. I put my, you know, uh, the invites out there and I've got some cool responses. So I'm, I'm looking forward to get that going. Awesome. Um, I've got a Facebook group, which is kind of where most of this started. Well, technically, I guess it was started on Instagram. So Instagram, Facebook, both uh, the Tarantula Collective. And um, I mean, I'm everywhere. Twitter, Reddit, Tumblr, TikTok, like whatever social media you're on. I'm sure you can find the Tarantula Collective on there. I spend way too much time. Uh, <laughs> put content out on those other platforms. Awesome. So it'll be pretty easy for anybody to find you with that. And yeah. I'll put we'll a link to the tarantula collective.com. Yeah. Uh -huh. The tarantula collective.com. And I got everything linked there. Okay. Make it easy. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the way to do it. So, uh, yeah. and I've, I've enjoyed, um, you know, I've only recently subscribed to you and kind of discovered your channel, but I really enjoyed the content that I've seen. So I highly recommend if you haven't checked out Richard's channel, the tarantula collective, Go and do it. Um, as you've seen, it's he's he's a wealth of information on tarantulas, and it's been really fun. So, once well, again, Richard, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on.
I appreciate you having me. I hope we can do it again soon. Hey, me too. Thanks, everyone.